Um, okay, I think we're good to go, hopefully. Um, so you're gonna have to bear with me because I'm gonna be switching screens a lot here um, and having to, I'm recording this on Zoom so that we can um, put it up. So I'll have to reshare screens a bunch, but um, what I'm gonna talk about today is really short form communication for a technical audience. Um, so this is kind of in complement to what Andy talked about last spring, which was really short form communication for a non-technical audience um, in things like the three minute thesis competition or uh, research in the state, things like that. So I'm gonna focus on posters and rapid oral presentations. Um, and this really is a tri-society's meeting focus, I guess, um, for different meetings, uh, the requirements might, um, or the expectations might be a little bit different. So just keep that in mind. Um, so I don't know you all super well, so I figured I would give a little introduction about myself before I get going here. So I am from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Um, I grew up with a background in agriculture ever since I was little, and that really led to an interest in pursuing this as a career. So I got my bachelor's in agronomy, and my master's in soil science, both from the University of Manitoba, which are in my hometown. And then I took a couple years to obtain my certified crop advisor status, and work as an agronomist running a field scale research program. So I was working directly with farmers. And then eventually I made my way 12 hours, almost directly south, and uh, started my PhD with Dr. Nelson in January of 2022. And why I'm the one giving this talk today, um, I'm definitely not an expert in this area, but I have had a lot of experience in this area. Um, so I've given more than 25 professional presentations now between my master's, my job, and my PhD. Um, and as you all likely saw, uh, I placed first in the triple SA soil fertility and crop nutrition um, poster and rapid oral presentation competition last year, which is quite a mouthful. So I do want to say, uh, like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm just going to share what's worked for me. And um, it's OK if it falls down. I could just use the PowerPoint version. Um, and uh, yeah, really just started a discussion about what we think is the best approach for posters um, and rapid oral presentations. So we're going to hopefully have time for discussion of questions or different ideas um, towards the end. Okay, so my plan is to give you my five minute rapid oral presentation and my poster presentation, because I really think that the best way to learn good presentation skills is just by hearing them and figuring out what you like and what you don't like and what works for you and what doesn't. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to kind of summarize with just some key tips. I've got like four or five key tips for a rapid oral presentation and a poster presentation, and then we can discuss. Um, so if you're not familiar with what a rapid oral is, uh, I would say this is something that's kind of newer, sort of, um, to the kind of like technical science communication part of things. But it's definitely becoming more popular, particularly at the Tri Society meetings. I know the Triple SA in particular. Um, I'm not sure if it's all, but it's certainly most of their po poster competitions now have a rapid oral component to them. So their requirements and the requirements I had to meet. Um, basically, you have a an oral presentation slot, just like you would have a 15 minute oral, but it's five minutes maximum, a three slide maximum, and you can have no animation on your slides. So you really have to utilize those three slides very effectively. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually play the recording, hopefully, if it works, of my actual presentation from last year. One, so I didn't have to perfect it again a year later. And two, so you can see how it actually went um, on the day. So hopefully, if I can find my mouse. OK. I'm pretty sure had the audio set up. Yeah. I wonder if we can turn that up somehow. Oh, yeah. Good, how are you? Come on in. No, you're totally fine. I'm Megan Burns, That's a PhD student at Kansas State University. So managing phosphorus loss from agricultural systems to the environment is critical to the sustainability of our production. With that in mind, a long-term study was established back in 2014 near Manhattan, Kansas, to investigate the effects of key fertilizer management and the addition of cover crops to a no-till corn soybean system. With this 
specific portion of the study. We're interested in the effects of our treatments on phosphorus cycling through the system, on agronomic phosphorus seed deficiency, and environmental phosphorus seed deficiency. Uh, for the results from the sea fertilizer management portion, we'll have to swing by my poster later this afternoon. But for now, we'll talk about the effect of our cover. <laughs> so uh, looking at the agronomics and phosphorus cycling in the system, where we had cover crops, we saw an increase in total phosphorus uptake and total phosphorus return in the system as a whole, which is what we would expect where we have more biomass accumulating nutrients with that cover crop treatment compared to no cover. However, we didn't see an effect of our cover crop on main crop phosphorus cycling, so on uptake, removal, or return in our main crop. And we also didn't see an effect um, of our cover crop treatment on agronomic phosphorus use efficiency. Now, things get more interesting when we talk about phosphorus use efficiency from an environmental perspective. So we're looking at uh, environmental phosphorus use efficiency as the portion of phosphorus that we're using in runoff. So we've calculated that as the amount of phosphorus we have in our runoff divided by the total amount of phosphorus we assume to be leaving the system in a given year. So that's the combination of our phosphorus we're using in runoff and the phosphorus that we're utilizing uh, agronomically and exporting in the grain harvest, and we've expressed that as a percentage. So that's what you see on the y-axis of this picture here. And you'll notice that the effect of cover crop on this percent P runoff metric is definitely variable year to year. So in 2017 and 2018, we actually see significant increases in the portion of phosphorus that's leaving the field as runoff losses with that cover crop treatment compared to no cover. And then in 2019, things flip around and that cover crop treatment is actually looking good from an environmental conservation perspective. And we have a decrease in uh, the percent P runoff with that cover crop treatment, which of course is what we're hoping to see where we implement cover crop um, as a conservation tool. So what's driving these differences year to year? Um, it probably comes down to the combination effect of our cover crop biomass accumulation and uh, the amount of precipitation we have on an annual basis. And of course, those two things interact to affect runoff water dynamics across the field. So in 2017 and 2018, uh, we had pretty decent cover crop biomass accumulation that likely slowed the movement of runoff water across the surface of the soil, which increases the interaction time between that runoff water and the surface, and that increases the opportunity for phosphorus to come into solution in that runoff water. So in 2017 and 2018, excuse me, that's what we saw. We saw an increase in the fraction of uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus or solution phosphorus in the runoff sample from those cover crop plots compared to no cover plots. So then what happened in 2019? Uh, well, the first thing you'll probably notice about this year is we had a very sad looking cover crop in 2019, um, but we also had substantial precipitation. And a lot of that precipitation came very early and very intense precipitation events in the growing season. Um, so 2019 was actually the only year where our cover crop treatment significantly reduced the total quantity of runoff that we had compared to no cover plots. Um, and you can see visually the apparent difference in, in soil and sediment loss on the right in those images there as well. Um, so it was a case that a little bit went a long way with that cover crop uh, in, in 2019. Um, and that reduction in the total amount of runoff we had obviously translated to a reduction in, in the um, fraction of phosphorus that was leaving our system as runoff loss to the environment in that year. So putting it all together, how do cover crops impact phosphorus cycling and efficiencies in our system? Well, we saw that total phosphorus uptake and return was increased where we had cover crops compared to no cover, um, but those cover crops weren't affecting main crop phosphorus uh, access and utilization um, or agronomic phosphorus use efficiency. And then as we just discussed, the effect on environmental use efficiency, that percent P runoff metric was variable uh, year to year. So boiling it down, cover crops are you know, evidently not a silver bullet solution to manage phosphorus loss. And um, it certainly depends on uh, conditions, your system, the year, et cetera. But we do recognize that they obviously provide a number of conservation benefits to the system. And we think it really comes down to evaluating their use based on specific goals and on a case-by-case -case basis. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And I hope to see you at my poster later. OK, I will say. Five minutes feels like an exceptionally short time when you're trying to make a presentation and an eternity when you have to stand here and listen to yourself mm -hmm. talk. Um, so that's my rapid oral presentation. Um, what I'm gonna do is just go right into giving you my poster. So you can see, oh, that's not the right thing. You can see what information I um, would give in my poster presentation that I kind of glossed over uh, majorly in my five minute rapid oral. Um, I recognize that this is going to be really tiny and you're not going to be able to see what I'm talking about, but you'll get the gist and we can unroll that later if you want to see the, um, the proportions and sizes and things like that. 
Um, so just to preface this, uh, going into this competition, uh, one thing that Dr. Nelson suggested that I think I will do for all of my poster presentations going forward is to have like three different lengths of presentations, basically. So you want to have like if someone comes up to your poster and says, what is the most interesting thing about your research? You can tell them in 90 seconds everything they need to know. Um, which for me, I would talk about this figure right here, which is what I highlighted in my rapid oil. And then you want to have one that you would tell most people or you would give to most people who come up. I like to target three to four minutes. And then you can have a slightly longer one, which is probably the version you're going to get today because I haven't done this in a year. So it's probably going to be a little less succinct than it would be if I was practiced at giving kind of like a three to four minute talk. But I think especially when you're in competition and you're trying to um, you don't know who the judges are when they come up. So you need to kind of tell everyone your whole story as best you can. Um, but a key thing is to be very succinct when you do so. So I'm going to go through it now and you can kind of see how I do that. Uh, but keep in mind that I would probably shave this down by like at least a minute and 30 seconds um, for actual uh, presentation to judges. So here we go. Um, so phosphorus uh, inputs to our agricultural systems are critical for agronomic production. Um, however, phosphorus loss from agricultural systems in runoff water is extremely detrimental to the environment and can contribute to eutrophication and the development of algal blooms. With that in mind, um, what we really need to develop is sustainable conservation practices that are effective both agronomically and environmentally in terms of reducing that potential for environmental harm. So uh, near Manhattan, Kansas, we developed a long-term study to uh, look at this and see if we could use cover crops as a system addition, um, along with different pea fertilizer management uh, strategies to try and reduce overall phosphorus loss from the system. Uh, what this uh, poster is focused on, but my portion of the research is focused on, is looking at phosphorus cycling through the system and then agronomic and environmental phosphorus use efficiency. So just a couple key things about our methods. Uh, you can see the site here. One thing to point out is these are larger plots. So each of those plots is about half a hectare in size, and each one is its own individual watershed. So that allows us to collect runoff water data from each individual plot, which is really important for our work. Uh, so we are in a proper corn soybean rotation at this site. So it's corn one year, soy the next, and it is a no-till site and has been no-till since 2014. So we're working in a two by three factorial. We've got two levels of cover crop just with and without, and then three different pea fertilizer management treatments, zero pea control, a fall broadcast treatment, and a spring injected treatment. So looking at phosphorus cycling results, um, just to quickly summarize this, uh, the cover crop did not affect uh, main crop phosphorus access or utilization, uh, which is a really good thing from an agronomic perspective that cover crop wasn't interfering with the main crop's ability to access and utilize the phosphorus in the system. And if we look at our phosphorus fertilizer treatments, generally speaking, um, anytime we added phosphorus to the system, whether it was fall broadcast or spring injected, we saw an increase in the amount of phosphorus moving through our cover crop and the main crop, as we would expect, compared to the control. Uh, for agronomic phosphorus use efficiency, we looked at this as a traditional PUE calculation, and then also in terms of apparent recovery efficiency, which uses a difference in uptake as the numerator in the equation. Nothing too exciting happened here. Uh, we didn't have any effect of cover crop or pea fertilizer treatment on uh, either agronomic use efficiency metric, but we did see a significant main effective year and it's quite obvious that our two corn years um, had a much greater phosphorus use efficiency than our two soybean years, not unexpected at all based on what we know from the literature. What is most interesting about this research is our environmental phosphorus use efficiency metric. So the way that we've calculated this is we are looking at this as the percent phosphorus runoff. So that is the amount of phosphorus that we're losing in runoff divided by the total amount of phosphorus we assume to be leaving our system in a given year. And that's going to be the sum of that phosphorus that's leaving in runoff and then the phosphorus that we're removing in the grain at harvest time. So that's what's on the y-axis of these two figures here. If we look at the uh, effect of cover crop, we had a significant interaction by year. And you can see that there's a lot of variation in the effect of cover crop on that percent P runoff metric year to year. What it really boils down to is the interaction between cover crop biomass and precipitation events within a year, uh, which really affect runoff water dynamics. So in 2017 and 18, for example, we had quite a substantial uh, cover crop there, a really good cover crop stand. 
What that does is it can physically slow the movement of runoff water across the field, allowing more time for uh, that runoff water to pick up phosphorus from the surface of the soil or the tissue that's on the surface of the soil. So that's likely what's driving this increase we see in the amount of phosphorus that we're losing in runoff in those two years with the cover crop, which is obviously not what you want to see when you're implementing a cover crop as a conservation practice to reduce peat loss. However, in 2019, we saw this flip around. Um, so our cover crop plots had a quite substantial reduction in uh, the percent pea runoff compared to no cover. Um, we had a really poor cover crop stand, but we had a lot of intense precipitation events very early in the spring before any of our main crop was out of the ground that year. So that little bit of cover crop went a long way at reducing the intensity of our runoff events. And that's what's driving the significant reduction in percent pea runoff with the cover crop in that year. And then really when it comes to the effect of fertilizer um, on percent P runoff, it's basically what we would expect to see whenever we're adding phosphorus to the system, we're losing more P. Um, and it was pretty similar between the fall broadcast and spring injected treatments, except in 2017, where our spring injected performed a little, a little better than fall broadcast from an environmental perspective. So boiling it all down to summarize, um, agronomically speaking, our cover crop wasn't interfering with our main crops ability to access and utilize phosphorus. Um, but when it comes to implementing cover crops as a mechanism to try and reduce phosphorus loss from the system, they're obviously not a silver bullet solution. They don't take care of it in every situation. Um, and really, it should come down to implementing a cover crop based on system specific goals. The end. And this is where they would ask questions. Um, usually, always, there are questions from them. Um, okay, so we go back to my little tips here. Okay. So for the rapid oral, so I did them back to back so you could kind of see the difference in the amount of information that I was giving in my rapid oral versus my poster presentation. So for the rapid oral, the biggest thing is to maximize use of your three slides, right? So if you can't have any animation, and you can only have three slides, you really want to make the most use of them that you can. And as an example, this, this was my first slide. You'll see that I had my title and my like authors and author affiliations, which was a requirement. I had to have those. But I also use this slide to talk about my methods and my site and even start talking about my results. Um, so making the most use of your space possible is really critical when you only have three slides. And then my next tip, and this is like the biggest thing I saw when I sat in that room and listened to like 15 other rapid oral presentations, do not talk about everything. I know it's so tempting because you've done all this work and you want to tell people about it. And you feel like you need to tell your whole story, but do not try and cover your entire research project in five minutes because you will not be successful at getting your message across. So you'll notice I didn't even talk about my phosphorus fertilizer treatments at all. I said, hey, if you want to listen to that, come see my poster, which is kind of the point of these rapid orals. It's like a little advertisement to get people to come see your poster later that day. Um, so I would really focus on the key finding or what's most interesting um, and really just talk about that. And then spend the majority of your time talking about the results. That's what people listen to rapid orals for. They're not there to hear what you did in the lab or how you did it in the field. They will ask those questions and find you later if they have them. It's important information but it's not the right setting to give all of those details. So those are my rapid oral top tips. And then my poster top tips, it was pretty hard to see. Um, it's probably best if you take a look at that poster or I can put my um, poster PowerPoint back up here and you can have a closer look. Um, my biggest two things is nobody wants to read a paragraph when they're standing there looking at your poster and nobody wants to read a novel's worth of information. So think about it as an audience member. If you walk through posters, I walk right past the ones that have more words than they do visuals. I just am not interested in standing there and reading a book. Um, this will vary based on personal preference. You might have a mix of paragraphs and bullet points. That's fine. My poster was entirely bullet points. I didn't have any paragraphs on there. And that's just my preference because that's, as an audience member, what I prefer to look at is very short form. Um, sentences. Um, I also think it's really important to include several visuals, and that seems really obvious, 
um, but it makes your poster more visually interesting and helps catch people's attention as they're walking by, um, which means you get to interact with more people, which I think is a big benefit of a poster presentation versus something like a traditional oral presentation. Um, you get to tell more people about your research, which we love to do as grad students. So um, I would include several visuals and make them visually interesting. Like my poster was very colorful, um, which you don't, I mean, it doesn't need to be super colorful, but it will tend to draw people in a little bit more and hold their attention more. And then you probably didn't get this effect very well because I was doing this with the TV and not my actual poster and you're kind of far away, but I like to set my poster up to tell my story. So my poster kind of followed like a serpentine pattern. And I definitely try and like direct people's attention to uh, the visual that I am talking about as I'm doing it. So I think this is really critical when you go to set up your poster, you wanna think about the, the story or the message that you're trying to get across in your data. Um, and that is how you should set your poster up is however you can best tell that story and walk your readers or your audience members um, through the flow of your poster. I also don't like when you have to jump back and forth between sections and draw people's attention all over the place, it should follow a better flow and people will stick with you a little bit more. So you'll notice I did have to go back to my methods to draw attention to that one uh, EPUE calculation, um, but I really try and minimize that. And then also an obvious, but definitely worth mentioning, um, any competition you enter or just poster presentations in general, even if it's not a competition, will have size regu regulations as well as they usually have like font size suggestions um, and it's very important to follow those. So um, my final tips are just kind of general presentation tips, I guess. I think it's really important as a grad student to keep in mind that you are the expert on your project. And I know that it probably doesn't feel like that a lot. It probably feels like your advisor is the expert on your project, but they aren't because their whole life isn't your project, but yours is. So you know your project better than anyone else in the world. And I think that if you remember that when you go into a presentation, you can have a lot more confidence in your level of knowledge when people start asking you questions. So my last step is to be confident. Even if you're faking it, your presentation will be so much more successful if everyone thinks, wow, you are so confident giving that talk. Even if you're shaking in your boots, it's okay. Um, so that's all I have for you. Questions? comments, discussion, things you would do differently. Um, bring it on. I'll maybe put my poster back up if that'll be helpful. There you go. Does anyone have any questions? Do you remember the size of the poster and the size of the phone? I can look because it's right. This is the PowerPoint that I made it in. Um, where's my notes? So this will be in like millimeters or something. Okay, so this is about to be majorly unhelpful, probably. But what I set up in PowerPoint, my width is 111 centimeters. And my height is 111 centimeters. So mine's in metric because I'm Canadian. I'm not sure if everyone's PowerPoint is in metric, but <laughs> mine is. But yeah, that's how big. Hmm? 111, 111. Yeah. That's how big this is. Yeah, I think, yeah, it should be. And then my font. I think most of it's size 28. Yeah. Is it going into the other thing? Yeah. So, a question about the size. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you always have like a, the maximum. Yeah. Right? And of course, uh, yeah, what I usually do is like just use the maximum mm -hmm. uh, allowed, but you think it, it's, Mm, that is the best or like I do. I think that you should use the maximum or very close to it because if you use anything smaller, you have less space and it's probably going to raise questions about why is your poster so small. If anything, if you're worried you don't have enough information to put on your poster, make everything bigger because the bigger that stuff is, the better it is actually for people to see and to interpret and someone might actually read your whole thing, right? Like go through your whole poster. So yes, I think it should be like very close to maximum size. 
Um, then another question. Uh, today in the meeting, we were uh, talking about like like a new way to show mm -hmm. uh, the, the the research information, like to show like a like a brief instead of your the title of your research, mm -hmm. like a like a statement. Result. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, um, like the distribution of the instead of the classical like uh, objectives, mm -hmm. methods, market or methods, like uh, more focused on results mm -hmm. and then the title. I really yeah. because your results and you'll notice when I gave my poster, I really tried to gloss over the top part, right? So that's there for information. And what would happen is a lot of people, I talked to a ton of people when I gave this, like so many people stopped by my poster. And if they have a question or they want to know more about your methods or the way you set up your trial or something about the background to this, like they'll ask those questions, right? So you don't want to give them all that information if you don't need to. And I don't necessarily think you even need to have that as a focal point on your poster because a lot of the times you're standing there to give them that information if they want it, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's a great idea to have. I think it'll capture a lot of attention that way, which is good. That's what you want. Yeah. Go ahead. No, the other week we had also Connie workshop and we brought this topic because it's like a trend. So mm -hmm. you can go to one of my posters, I never remember the name. Better, better. Better, yes. So, but I think you should target the audience because, mm -hmm. for example, in my case, that I mean, so physics, if I show like just a poster with a title the most important one and some pictures i don't know if they say this is i'm gonna be super happy with that change so i think it's gonna depend on your audience but also you can try to like balance so you can try to improve i mean to adopt this trend mm -hmm. to like more i don't know how to say but in in a transition way you could even have like you could have your traditional background and methodology, maybe maybe like pare it down a little bit, and then you could have your result statements like big and called yeah, out maybe. here, and then your most interesting figure or picture or whatever relates to it. Like, and that could be the majority of your poster. Yeah. But I mean, it's always a risk to go outside the box if you're in a competition yeah. and you want to win. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with because I trying it. Last year, I. Uh, I did a really classical one, but um, there was a, a guy that I will won't forget him. He was like, "Ah, oh, okay, but why don't you put like in this graph the bars and and why don't you? Because what I we usually like is to see this and like the, you have to follow like just a pattern yeah. to tune to like the yeah, yeah. and it was so like uh, typical, but yeah, yeah uh, just. It's like, so yeah, I think it will really depend on, on, on the yeah. audience, but, yeah. and also of the judge. Yes, yeah. it's so 100%. Sub subjective. Yes, like, it totally is. Even on their interpretation of your research, it's really mm -hmm. so subjective. Yeah. So, but I think, I mean, I guess my opinion on that or my point of view is you don't know until you try it. And the beautiful thing about a poster competition is you get a lot of immediate feedback from people because you're talking to them one-on-one -on -one mostly. So. I vote go for it and see how it goes. But the other, did you have a question? It was pretty related oh. to that. Um, so, how do you feel that the judge like write more? Like in these days, uh, you have a lot of pictures, a lot of uh, different colors. But the following out the Paula that say that. Whenever you have these better poster presentations, mm -hmm. um, so in your area, which is uh, soil, how do you feel about the judges? So you think that they're kind of more, I would say, open to the new style or kind of more old version? So I will say, I uh, it's kind of tricky because you didn't. They do everything digitally now, so no one's like walking around with a clipboard. Like you used to be able to spot judges, you know. And now they're all on their phones. So to be honest, the entire time, like Dr. Nelson showed up at six when the poster session ended. And I was like, I don't think I got judged. He was like, no, they were here. I was like, oh, good. I had no idea. Um, but clearly it worked. Uh, so I think a lot of my judges were young. And I think 
if they are younger or earlier on in their professional career, they're going to be a lot more open to seeing different things. And it's probably an opportunity to start getting those things out there to be more accepted, right? Because if we don't start making those shifts and changes, um, which other areas of work show us are more beneficial for our communication abilities, like at some point we have to just make that change, right? So I think that the judges I had would have been quite receptive to that. Um, I also, it's, I think, a lot of personal preference about how much color and to be honest, all these graph colors, this is just consistent with what we do at the CAW. I didn't like intentionally use a bunch of color. That's just what we do. Um, there is intentional color in the images. And again, this is like, you know, I wouldn't want that to be in black and white or something. But some people probably look at that and go like, that is a ridiculous amount of color. I think what it does is when people are walking past your rows and rows of posters, they stop when they see one that looks like this. And I noticed that this poster competition more than anyone I've done in the past. And I had more figures on here and more images and less words than I've done before. And I like, I probably talked to 45 people in my two hour at least. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, my opinion on that. Yeah, that was my uh, question. Like, uh, it happened to me that it was like too many people. Yes, it was a me. lot. <laughs> so, um, at first, I was like so motivated yeah. and explaining and everything, and then I was like, "Yeah, so here, here. like, um, do you think it's better? Like, well, of course, the best is to be up all the whole thing. I, but like, do you explain something like fast, and and you also don't know who are the judges, yeah. and who is just, uh, yeah. yeah. So something you can do is actually ask them what version of your presentation that they want. You can, and don't ask them like, how long do you want me to talk to you? But like, <laughs> <Don't> you, <laughs> yeah. start your timer. No, you can ask them like, do you want, I usually ask them, you know, if they come up and they're looking at it, they haven't said anything to me, which is the worst at posters. You're just standing there staring at each other. Um, I usually ask them if they would like an overview of my project. Mm -hmm. And then I will give them three minutes. So shorter than what I gave you guys, because like I said, I just wasn't. Yeah, so, some of them ask you like, uh, okay, give me like the general idea. Yeah. So I would say like two and a half to three minutes. Mm -hmm. And then what that does is it gives them, even if it's shorter than that, if you just pick out, like, I think it's really important to obviously tell them what you're studying, like set up, give a sentence on like, this is why I'm doing this and this is what I'm doing. And then even if you just gave them like, I could have boiled this down to like a sentence and a half probably. I could have glossed over that because it's very boring. And then I would have spent maybe like a minute and a half talking about this. And then I could have said, that's it. And then they can ask questions if they have questions. So I think, yeah, when you have a lot of people stopping by, that's why I think having a shorter version mm -hmm. of your talk kind of prepped and ready is, is kind of important. Yeah. But sometimes you can, like, I have people come up and just say, what's the most interesting thing about your research? Or mm -hmm. tell me you have like 30 seconds go, like. Mm -hmm. Which is very short, but yeah. yeah. Very good. I don't know what to do when someone is approaching to my poster. If I should start, um, I mean, asking if they want a presentation or something. Or yeah. Just... Yeah. So, so prior to this, I disclaimer: I do not like poster presentations mm -hmm. at all. I would much rather give a fifteen-minute oral presentation. For this reason, it's I find it very awkward, and you talk forever, and it's very tiring. But I think if you effectively interact, you get a lot of really good feedback about your work, not just your poster, but your research. And you get to interact and ask questions and get different questions asked of you. Anyways, um, I think um, what I did differently this time is everyone who walked up, I initiated a conversation with them. So I would greet them and then give them like five seconds to just let their eyes go over it. And if they didn't say something, I would ask them if they wanted me to tell them about my research, if they wanted me, yeah, me to tell them about my work. And pretty much everyone said yes. Mm -hmm. So that just takes the, you're not like standing there like, do I say something, do I not? Because some people just want to read it in peace and move mm -hmm. on, which is fine. So then they can say no. Yeah, yeah. that's how I did it. But kind of takes the awkwardness out of it just a little. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. And then in the five minute presentation, mm -hmm. I have so many questions that I, I wasn't prepared for that. Like, 
I it's like, a okay, weird I'm gonna focus on this part yeah. first and then but then um, questions like about the irrigation system yeah. or like uh yeah whatever. it's a really strange form of communication um it it, all, it is it really is because it's such a weird amount of time um yeah and people that you don't know and you don't know what they do and, yeah uh, it's really yeah it's really tough i think just trying to pick obviously you need some introduction some very basic methodology but just sticking to your results is probably the best thing you can do that's really sticking to your most interesting results i guess is the best thing you can do um for that but yeah i don't I have you know, more to put. Or you don't even mention <laughs> they so can figure that out in the poster. yeah oh thank you have a look no, if it, I don't know. Actually, it right. depends on how we set the mode in mind. One known question becomes, uh, well, they, I think they mine, and they start get, oh, yeah. Something yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, in the like, end, yeah, I yeah, to, like too much. So the next time it's like, oh, yeah, so like, how is the format? We have like a line of the people presenting, and they pretty much, yeah, we have like your questions, and then questions, like, what are you? Uh, yeah. that we are not I don't know. Right. It's so who's planning to do five minutes for our rapid presentation? Oh wait, I yeah. I watched one that the judges were there making questions, and they say like, "Hey, we are the judges, and we will like know that." I mean, it's good if they ask you questions because it is, it means that it's interesting. Yeah, but that's true. You just have like that huh? for them to do this. In my I think it was more in my session, like and it was known question the guy basically said, I can't quite go to the point. Yeah, I think, yeah. There were too many people for that. Yeah, it was one of them. Yeah. And yeah. ours, you were, we were in the same section, right? Did anyone even ask questions at the end? Because they, we all went, and then there was like time for questions after all of the five minute presentations were done. Not and I don't think any. It was questions. like uh, each person has the. Five minutes and then question. Yeah. Other person, five minutes and question. Yeah. Yeah, for us it was like all at the end. The questions were all uh -huh. after everyone had gone. But I'm going to stand here, but I I because <laughs> I hear I don't know, like some steps. I don't know where it's usually time. sorry about this. Um, like yeah, I am it's <laughs> also you're usually right beside someone else too. Like mm -hmm. you're sharing a board thing. So my poster was set up on this side with the end of the board and i had a little like alleyway here yeah because, so i would stand because also we have another one another mm -hmm. person you, you kind of are forced stand. to stand really close to your poster yeah. but yeah and then you just yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you have a stupid question i don't think the position of the board would make difference yes because i was the last moving to the wall like the oh, last yeah. line was like few lines. But you don't the whole time. Yeah, maybe. Like, yes, I was only I was one row in from that, so there was like the posters that I was looking at would have been like the back side of what you were on. So I was only one row in, but yeah, people probably walked down that one that they can look at too, like on either I side. Think one wall, but one, one yeah, I wall. think you're right. I think especially at something like. The tri societies when there's hundreds of posters like yeah but that is the reason because you have to make other posters um, yes really that's why you want to make people stop yeah. and look at your stuff yeah so i know you got this like a thin suit i don't know <laughs> <laughs> make yourself stand out <laughs> um any other questions that i can answer no, what the, what the, um, that's a kind of intense question. Here, you want to see the wrong data. Weird. Interesting. Um, <laughs> does anyone have anything that they really like to do in a poster presentation that is different from what I've talked about? Because that's totally valid to discuss at the moment as well. No, I don't. so have you have you used like extra materials for for your poster? So like in my case, I have like a bunch of figures. I won't be able to put all of them in the poster. 
Oh, I see. So like having extra yeah. stuff with you. Um, I haven't, I don't think, um, actually that's not true. Last year, maybe at this poster, I don't know. I had a clipboard and I had a few things printed out, um, mainly because I wasn't going to remember them well enough to like accurately give information. I didn't end up pulling it out at all. Nobody asked me for it or asked me a question related to it. Um, I would recommend bringing it so that you have it, but probably not drawing attention to it. Because if it's the most important stuff about your work, it should be on your poster. I can't add something for you. I kind of have a similar problem with that now. So, but I already have uh, a PDF the most complete version of the poster. So I would put that a QR code. Oh, that is that smart. Is that. That's, yeah, uh, listen to that. So, That's so you good. just, that way you share that PDF yeah. or grab any information and stuff like that. So you say, hey, if you want to see the other two, just scan that and you know, That's a really good PDF idea. PDF is more, is more that, loud. That's cheating. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. Hey, well, yeah, you have I, questions? I, Go here. They are okay. really interesting. <laughs> But it's common to see a QR yeah. also with the same search. I said, okay, tell me, you might have paper published yet, but I guess just just look at the PDF. Yeah. You know, on the it's paper good. or fertilizer or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. report. It's totally good idea. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Guys, don't forget to put in your name here before you guys leave. I'm starting after the challenge. Yesterday, I made this one. I did it, and I was doing it. Yeah, you have a picture. I think that if you want to, you have a picture. So I will do it. Seriously, I want to stop. Here we go. Yes. Hi. Yeah, for sure. Just let me just one